Nicolas. Welcome to What If I Say Yes. How are you? I am good, thank you. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to do this. Um, at the moment, I'm not regretting it. <laughs> That's a good sign. Exactly. Okay, Nicolas. Um, I well, um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to my audience, however you like. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm Nicholas Baldwin, uh, officially Dr. Nicholas Baldwin, and I'm the Dean and Director of Operations at Roxton College of Fairleigh Dickinson University. And the reason why I say that mouthful is because that's fairly important, if not significantly important, for the reason why I'm going to say yes. Okay. Now, um, can you then tell the audience how we know of each other or how we know each other? Well, a former student of mine, Carlos, um, has put us in touch. So I now know, of course, who to blame or, or who to thank, which I'll conclude at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So um, before we get to the what if I say yes moment, then yeah. I have to say what I know of you. So I met Carlos in 2000. Um, then we got married and we had uh, Maya. So throughout our history as a couple, I've heard stories about not necessarily Nicolas because it was very informal. He, he was very, um, he, he held even a very high regard. He still does, but he called you Dr. Nicholas, not Dr. Baldwin. So uh, I hear stories along the way about Dr. Baldwin. Okay. Okay. And here's what I know. So Carlos went um, in September of 1992 to this semester abroad in Rockstone right. yes. College. After having been in a community college in Mercer College, he then moved to a private institution, Farley Dickinson. And after I believe a year, um, a professor there suggested that he took advantage of this opportunity, which was a semester abroad. It was the first time he had ever left the country. Mm -hmm. It was a huge eye-opening experience for him. And that's where he met you. That's right. Um, he said he remembers he took a class called Britain Today. Yes. Okay. And then another one was British Foreign Policy. Yeah. And another one, British Government and Politics. Yes. He, he, he chose all three courses taught by <laughs> me. I think he did another one as well. But all, okay. all those three were taught by me. So we got to know each other really rather well. Yes, there was a semester where he also learned about literature, so basically yes. Shakespeare. <laughs> so anyway, but the loveliest part is um, that he remembers that, um, well, he remembers your office, very well organized. He remember having been to your office and you had this on your desk, this before internet, of course, all these newspapers from all over the world. <laughs> and that's how you started your day, just reading across, let the news across the globe. That's right. Uh, you were very professional. You were very nice. Um, and at some point, I think- Sorry, how, how much am I paying him for having said all this? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a secret amount. We're not okay. disclosing that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but at any point, I think he needed help with writing, and you offered mm -hmm. him, um, you mentioned he could go to your office early in the morning and you could offer that help. And so he went several times um, and it helped him tremendously. So since then, well, he came back. And then your connection, your relationship has um, endured the test of time. <laughs> You're still yes, friends. Indeed. I think he mentioned before he left uh, that um, 
it wasn't until recently that he started calling you, well, at least in, in emails. Yeah, yeah. Nicholas. That's right. It took okay. several years. <laughs> <laughs> ah, one more thing. Every year we receive a Christmas card from you yeah. that has the picture of Roxton College. Yeah, that's yes. right. Okay, so you, um, it's funny that I've heard all these stories about Dr. Baldwin, and then I get to interview you, and the first thing I say is, hi, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> and I replied, so there you are, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, so now, um, tell us when in your, um, your, in your life you had this moment when you asked the question, what if I say yes? You then said yes, and then you got to do something. Okay. Um, well, two things I'll begin by saying. Firstly, there is an end to this story, so bear with me. Okay. And secondly, it's really, if this is allowed, and I'm not uh, breaking the rubric or whatever, it's a yes that led to several additional yeses. Yes. So it's a series of yeses, really. Um, and then it will become clear as to why uh, in a little while. So let me let me backtrack to 1984. Mm -hmm. Long time ago, I was living in the southwest of the country. I had been doing seven part time jobs all simultaneously and writing up my doctoral thesis. Um, oh my. So it, I was finish, putting the finishing touches to a 100,000 word thesis mm -hmm. and earning a living from, um, I was teaching um, at Exeter University uh, at uh, what was at that time called Plymouth Polytechnic. It's now the, the University of the Southwest. I was teaching a group of adult education uh, people in what was known as the WEA, the Workers' Educational Association. I was teaching the Devon and Cornwall Police, I was teaching the Royal Marines, and I was teaching the Royal Navy, and I was a research assistant in industrial relations to a, uh, a chap called Richard Clutterbuck. So earning bits of money all over the shop to try and uh, make sure that I could pay the bills and feed myself and so on, while completing my doctoral thesis. Mm -hmm. And to show how long ago it was, I was sitting in my, well, I called it a study, that was pompous, it used to be a cupboard, and I now had my desk in it, and uh, I was writing away by hand, didn't even have a typewriter, this predates word processors and laptops and the internet and all that, mm -hmm. and I put the the full stop, the period at the end of my conclusion for my doctoral thesis. Sat back, I had a cup of coffee or a mug of coffee, sat back, thought to myself, well, that's five years done. I really ought to try and find a job that's a little more set than seven part-time jobs all at the same time and trying to manage or juggle all of that mm -hmm. and quite literally at that moment the telephone rang mm -hmm. and it was a person called Philip Norton who had been my tutor as an undergraduate mm -hmm. at the University of Hull and uh, unbeknown to me he had uh, briefly been a tutor at a place called Roxton College in Oxfordshire, which was the British campus of Fairleigh Dickinson University. I had never heard of either. <laughs> and uh, the then head of the college had reached out to Philip to ask him if he knew of anyone who could teach a course for four weeks that summer. Now, this would have been May, and they were looking for someone to teach the last week of June, first three weeks of July. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I said, well, yes, I, I would be interested. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was not doing anything else and hadn't firmed up a permanent job. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, I went up 
oh, I don't know, three days later, I think it was, for an interview at, at Roxton and was there and then offered the position for four weeks to teach okay. a course for four weeks. A which course I on did. what? It was British government and politics. Okay. Towards the end of the four weeks, the head of the college asked if I would stay on to help with, to teach two or three lectures in a course that was coming in for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yes, I, I could stay on and do that, which I did. Mm -hmm. I was then asked if I would be interested in coming back. There was a few weeks closed, but coming back to teach a couple of courses in the fall semester, the 15 weeks fall semester of 1984, which I said yes to and which I did. I was then asked if I would come again and do a couple of courses in the spring semester of 1985. Mm -hmm. So I again said yes to that and I did. Now, during that semester, mm -hmm. the then head of the college was on sabbatical mm -hmm. and the university sent over a chap called Walter Savage who had just stepped down from being um, interim president at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And he came over to coordinate the semester. Mm -hmm. He lived in the main building. I was living in the main building. We got on very well. Walter was a wonderful person. We got on very well, became very firm friends. Uh, at the end of that spring 1985 semester, Walter returned to the United States and I left Roxton to return back to my, my hometown in the far southwest of the country, ready to look for a job. <laughs> Two days later, I got a phone call from Walter <laughs> and he said, did I know that the head of the college had resigned? So I said, um, no, I did not know. And he said, well, um, he, Walter, was coming back to England to organize um, the summer program and whatever came after. And Walter said he had two questions to ask me. Mm -hmm. Firstly, would I be willing to come and teach on the four week summer program? So mm -hmm. summer 1985. And I said, yes. <laughs> and then he said, uh, would I like to then take over as head of the college? And I said, knowing Walter quite well, hmm, let me think about it, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I took over. Uh, actually, I came and taught on the summer programme and a couple of programmes, short-term programmes after that. <laughs> and then on August the 1st, 1985, I took over as head of the college. And that is... A number of years later so I've been here ever since so as I say that's why I say um, my, my yes or series of yeses but I hope you can see how they're related um, has had a profound impact on my life because I've been at Broxton College um, teaching at it and running it ever since August the 1st 1985 and it's now what April 2023 Mm -hmm. So uh, what are you about to say? I, I don't look that age. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I, I, I would be lying if I said I enjoyed every minute of it, but then no one's going to enjoy every minute of, uh, of everything they do. But I do believe I've been extraordinarily fortunate because it's a, it's a wonderful place. And I 99% um, of the time love my, my job and the people I'm dealing with and so on. So um, the, uh, the series of yeses, all related, have, as, a, as I say, I, I can't imagine quite where my life would have been or where I'd have been or whatever if I hadn't originally said yes to teaching here for four weeks in the summer of 1984. Those four weeks have become, gosh, 39 years later. So now, when you started with those little yeses, was that enough money for you to survive? 
for the uh, well, I've always been I've always been quite careful but um, uh, it was putting it together and putting it together I mean for the four weeks I just thought well yes I, I'm not going to at the moment I've got nothing else to do in those four weeks so I might as well do that and then it was two weeks and then 15 weeks and then 15 weeks and then taking over yeah so for those yeses that yes. seem fairly easy um yes did you ever did you ever stop and and think a little bit more than just saying yes instantly well no because i mean had someone said um do you want to commit the next 38 years of your life to this maybe I would have thought more than I did, but it was all very piecemeal. So it didn't at the time ever really seem like a very big yes. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it's like, well, do you want to come out for dinner tonight? Sort of thing. It seemed a, a, a sort of, you know, not an earth shattering or life changing decision. Even, even when asked to take over from the, uh, uh, from the then head of the college as head of the college. I mean, it, it, it was a wonderful thing to be asked, but again, it wasn't, well, you're committing your next 37 years of your life to this. Mm -hmm. um, I never, I never considered that. So um, I, I perhaps should say, um, I, I don't want to get too, uh, too philosophical or deep or whatever. Um, oh, you can. I, well, I, you want, you can. I know the, the reason for, you're doing this podcast, the uh, uh, time of saying yes or no, is because of your, your brother Hector mm -hmm. and your loss of him. Um, mm -hmm. Although I spend a lot of my life with very intricate planning, timetables and all of this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and I'm a great one for lists and so on, mm -hmm. I'm not really a great one for planning personally. And I put that down really to I lost my father um, when I was 13. 13. He died. He, he died at the age of 39 when I was 13. And whatever plans my parents had, um, of course, came to nothing because he died at the age of 39. Mm -hmm. So I've tended on a personal level to just go from day to day, really. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just happy to wake up alive in the morning, I think, and, and see, what, see what life throws at me. Mm -hmm. So as I say, although I'm, I'm a sort of mixture of someone who spends a lot of time in intricate planning, mm -hmm. but not for myself, if that, that sounds illogical and maybe doesn't make sense, but I no, think no, it no. is because of that. And just by... I mean, sensing your vibe through this conversation, it has worked very well for you. Um, well, time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I remember um, reading at one time that uh, you think of my background in government and politics and so on. The um, Chinese premier under uh, uh, Mao Zedong uh, was once asked in the 1970s, the 1970s what he thought of the french revolution mm -hmm. and his response was oh it's much too soon to tell <laughs> so uh the jury's is out we'll have to wait and see whether my saying yes was a good thing or a bad thing on the other hand perhaps it's for my students to say <laughs> <laughs> rather than me <laughs> um, so now when you were Finishing, or well, you were doing your doctorate. Yes. And, and when you were approaching the end, you didn't have an idea of what you wanted to do with your. Oh, well, I, I, I knew actually, this is again rather pathetic, perhaps. Um, yeah. well, maybe not pathetic, precocious, certainly. I <laughs> knew, I knew from the age of 10 that I wanted to get involved in politics and I liked school. I didn't like sitting exams, but okay. I liked school. I liked school work. And I heard that you could get the highest degree was a doctorate. <laughs> and that meant a lot of work, but no exams. So that's what I decided to do. 
And uh, subsequently, of course, uh, I, I realized that what I wanted to do was to go into uh, to academics and mm -hmm. teaching uh, because uh, I certainly like uh, teaching. I don't like grading, but I do like teaching. And uh, indeed, um, my predecessor at Roxton as head of the college didn't actually teach, but I, uh, I certainly wanted to. And one of the things that I said to Walter at the time when he asked me to take over as head of the college is that I, I, I would be certainly willing, keen, happy to take over, but only if I could continue teaching. teaching. Um, and I, I, I wanted to do that anyway, but I also was very strongly of the opinion that in a small personal tutorial based college, which Roxton is, when we're full, we only have 75 students here. Oh. So it's a small personalized uh, college uh, that I felt it was important for me to get to know the students and for the students to get to know me and also important for my faculty to be aware that I was also teaching so I knew what they were going through mm -hmm. and we uh, we talk about the students at regular every student at regular times and if I thought a student was very good for example and some of my faculty or a faculty member didn't think that that would help me evaluate my faculty member mm -hmm. uh, equally if I thought a student was very poor and a faculty member thought they were you know Einstein well, maybe subject matters are different, but equally it could shed light on, on the faculty member that way. So I thought in a small institution particularly, it was very relevant. But as I say, also, it was something I wanted to do because I, I very much enjoy teaching. Whether my students enjoy my teaching is another matter, but I certainly do. <laughs> well, I know of one student who really appreciates that. <laughs> that's, good. that's good to know. In all these years, I have one. There you are. <laughs> now, why politics? Oh, um, well, going way, way back, as, as long as I can remember, uh, politics was always discussed at home. Uh, mm -hmm. amongst uh, with my mother and father um, we were brought up to we had newspapers in the house mm -hmm. it, it was a regular thing you know to read them to discuss what was in them we always sat and watched the early evening news or the later evening news and discussed what was going on and so on mm -hmm. and uh, I mentioned the age of 10 because that 1968 there you are I've given away my age they are <laughs> 1968 I was 10 years old and it was a very important year for me mm -hmm. because I was I was profoundly impacted by several of the events that year. Mm -hmm. There was the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. There was the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And there was the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. and the overthrow of what was called the Prague Spring. Now, there were other things. There were student demonstrations in Paris, the riots there. There were demonstrations, anti-Vietnam demonstrations in London and so on. But uh, the Mexico, assassination of Dr. Had... King and of Robert Kennedy and of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, those three things had a, a very profound impact on me mm -hmm. and made me want to get involved academically in politics, but also um, actively involved in politics which I which I have done maybe not as much as I'd have liked but then I had to earn a living uh, uh, and uh, so politics had to take a, a, a back seat somewhat but I, I did stand for um, election at the national level way way back in 1983 actually before I started work at Roxton. Mm -hmm. What did your dad and mom do? Um, my my mother was before getting married, uh, well and after, uh, a physiotherapist, but mm -hmm. she she didn't work um, when um, she was married uh, until my father died, and then she she went back uh, to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father um, originally trained as a chef, but then uh, we had um, na what was called national service. So he went in the draft, as you would call it in, in the United States. He went into the Royal Air Force, became a bomber pilot in the 1950s and, uh, and early 60s. 
And when he left the Air Force, he went into to business. He was a sales director in a printing company. Mm -hmm. Why were they so interested in politics at home? Just generally they were. It, it, it certainly didn't seem unusual to me. Um, I think they were just keen and aware and alert and liked to know what was going on. And, and as I say, brought all of us up. I mean, it, I say it brought us all up to be aware. It just was there. We were aware because they were aware. But what I, what I mean is, was that happening in other households? Was that a common experience or was... If it was only at, at yours, why? Where did they took that interest from? Were they brought um, up? Well, way? I think I think it I think it probably talking to some of my uh, peers at the time and subsequently, I think it perhaps was uh, not unheard of, but more unusual than usual, shall I say? Hmm. But it certainly seemed it certainly didn't seem odd to me at the time. So you're not a single child. You mentioned siblings. No, I have a I have a sister who's two years older than me, and then a brother who's five years younger, and a brother who's an additional two years younger than that. So there's four of us. Did they all? Did they? Did some of them or any of them went into politics or, yeah. or um, that area? Uh, not no. Well, uh, my sister became a nurse. Mm -hmm. My uh, next brother down has done all sorts of things from teacher training and being a policeman to running his own business. My youngest brother actually became a, a journalist and then set up, set up his own public relations company. And he did get involved in politics at one time because he got elected to the local council uh, oh. for, a brief, for a brief period of time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I have, a, I have a niece, my uh -huh. sister's... Um, first and oldest uh, child, Hannah, who uh, is very involved politically. She is uh, on the local council. She is a candidate for parliament and is a member of her party's national organizing committee. Hmm. Did you did you have a, an impact on? I certainly hope so. <laughs> not least not least of all because she's in the right party. <laughs> <laughs> okay going back to teaching why were you interested in teaching why is that something that you um decided you wanted to wanted to do and that you never wanted to leave um that's a good question um uh, i think it's because i like teaching politics so it's it's very much i, I and i i don't i would not have had the patience to be a a high school teacher <laughs> at all let alone Why not? <laughs> oh i i'm not this sounds awful doesn't it i'm not interested in teaching anyone who's not interested in learning so having people in class who don't want to be in class is not something i'm interested in yes. so i uh, <laughs> i'm very happy to have people who are keen to be in the class and so on mm -hmm. so that's that's why it's at the at the university level really mm -hmm. um and I suppose I, I didn't say, oh, I want to be a teacher. Now, what shall I teach? It was I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in the academic side of, uh, of the subject. Uh, oh, and teaching's part of it. And then I got into teaching and thoroughly enjoyed it. So it was the politics that led to that rather than, oh, I want to be a teacher. Now, what shall I teach? Mm -hmm. Now, how would you say... How would you describe your teaching style? Um, again, I'm not sure that's up for me. Up to me. I mean, I'm. I, I hope I'm enthusiastic. No, uh, but I mean, in general, you're the ones who come and lecture for fifty minutes, and then. Oh, if if my students would probably say, if I've got a two-hour class, I'm probably speaking for three hours. No, um. Uh, <laughs> You know why? Why use a hundred words when a thousand will do? I'm um, I'm I'm not lost for something to say. Probably as this interview is showing, I'm happy to keep keep going and keep going. Um, I, I'm very interested in the subject matter, and I would hope to convey my enthusiasm for it uh, for the subject matter to my to my students. I uh, certainly I hope I'm. Um, uh, 
not just standing there and talking. I'll move about. I'm talking, but I'll move about and so on. Um, I uh, am much more likely to act something out in class than than just stand there. Um, mm -hmm. I move around a lot and and use my arms a lot. I'm I must have Italian blood in me somewhere or something. Like that. <laughs> As you've probably seen on occasions, my hands have shot up while talking, um, which <laughs> probably looks very odd in a small, uh, a small frame on the uh, on the computer. But um, <laughs> uh, as I say, I, I'm I'm certainly enthusiastic about the subject matter, and I would hope, irrespective of the the format, uh, I'm conveying that enthusiasm to my students. I hope. <laughs> You mentioned you didn't like what do you call seating exams? Oh, I hated exams. Yes. Yeah. Um, so seating exam just means seating to do an exam, or is that a category in and of itself that I? No, the, the actual the, the the former. I mean, at the end of a well, it wouldn't be unusual in in Britain to have, um, for example, a, a three year degree course, undergraduate degree course. The end of year. I mean, you have to do work during the t the year. But at the end, you would sit maybe five, three hour written exams, all of which you need to pass to get through to the second year. Okay. Exactly the same thing. All of what you need to do at the end of the second year, you have to pass those exams to get through to the third year. And your third year exams, your entire degree rests on you passing those five, three hour exams. Um, I certainly chose whenever I could um, courses that had continual assessment rather than exams at mm -hmm. the end. So, for example, um, of my five courses I did in my third year as my at my undergraduate, one was entirely on continual assessment. I had to write a, a junior year thesis, sort of twenty five thousand word paper, which I chose Chinese foreign policy, mm -hmm. and then two courses were. 50% on final exams, but 50% on coursework and, and so on. And those two were uh, parliament in the, in the 1970s and 80s, the British parliament, and also the power and personality of American presidents. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I did courses, two other courses, certainly, maybe three, I have to remember, so long ago, courses that were almost entirely based on exams. Mm -hmm. But as... Uh, as I said, the advantage of a doctoral thesis to me was all of the work, all of the research, writing a paper, okay, a long one, 100,000 words, but no exam. Well, there was a, an, a, a, a what's called a, a viva at the end. You, you sat with your examiner who asked you questions about what you've written about and so on before determining whether you've got the, 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 the degree or not. Just uh, one examiner? Um, in my case, it was just one examiner, yes. Hmm. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate because he was a, a, a lovely man called uh, Norman Crowther Hunt, Lord Crowther Hunt, who didn't put me through the ringer because as soon as I walked in the room, he said, don't worry, you've got the degree, now let's talk about your thesis. So oh. all of the pressure was, was off from that moment on, and we just had a rather nice chat about it. Mm -hmm. Did you publish your dissertation in, in parts yes in chapters in uh, in in books and things yes not not the entire thing it was quite quite involved and complicated with with a volume of footnotes and charts and so on so uh, i don't think anyone would have uh, would have published it the way it was but uh, <laughs> elements of it certainly have been published yes okay so now taking all these um comments about exceeding exams and what you were trying to avoid and what you mentioned uh, also that you don't like grading. Mm. How do you evaluate your students? Well, uh, having to do all of that because um, I, I would uh, normally have, well, students will be presenting in class mm -hmm. verbally and they also write a, uh, um, a, an essay uh, uh, for me during the term uh, and um, they're attendance and participation and involvement and presentations, that all counts for 50% of their final grade in a course. And uh, the other 50% is an essay-based three-hour exam. Because it is important to know that students have um, been able to take in and remember information. 
And it's also, you know, perhaps particularly in this day and age, it's relevant that they are um, able to produce something necessarily without um, the help of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so having a combination of verbal research and exam, I think gets, gets to be, you know, because some students are, are very good in class and just fall apart in exams. Now, should they be penalized if everything was on the exam? Equally, some people are better at exams than classwork. So I think trying to find a balance is a good way of, uh, of evaluating a student's ability. And so that's, uh, that's what I do. And that's what we do here at the college. So now tell me in all these years at Rockston, how has the teaching and the quality of the students or the, 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 the way the students process um, information change with the rise of the internet and then all these now we're talking about artificial intelligence and GPT and all these things that they can just sure, program well, into the internet and then get an essay. How that has changed? Yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps rather glad that I'm coming to the end of my career rather than the beginning. <laughs> uh, maybe that's, that, that's where I should leave it. But over the, over the years, I mean, the, the range of ability amongst students has always been mixed. Um, the, uh, the range has always been, or, or always, could certainly be quite, quite extreme. You could have, for example, four students in a, in a, in a group, a small tutorial group or whatever, uh, talking about government and politics, mm -hmm. and one might be a politics major, but had never done anything on Britain. One might be a politics major who maybe has had a class or, or whatever that involved British government and politics. Mm -hmm. You might have someone who um, has taken the occasional politics course out of interest. And you could have someone who's never done a politics course in their life and they could all be in the same class. Mm -hmm. So pitching the subject matter can be quite taxing in okay. that regard because you don't want people to think Oh, this is boring, I know all this, but equally in the same lecture, oh, I'm out of my depth. So mm -hmm. to try and find the right sort of balance is there. Certainly the best students over the years will be as good as a student as you'll ever encounter. And you have students who have, uh, have difficulty either with the subject or generally with academics anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a mixture. It's certainly not the case that, uh, you know, 20 years ago, they were better than they are today or, or vice versa. It's <laughs> ebbed and flowed and it's down to individual students. What I would say is that um, COVID and lockdown has had a noticeable effect. Uh, good or bad, I think the jury is out, but a notable effect on students. For example, the students we have currently at the uh, university um, will have spent the last couple of years of, of um, either their first year at university and their last year at high school, for example, often in lockdown and, and not in, in class except mm -hmm. online. And that, that's different. And I think they're still working their way through that, uh, mm -hmm. for example. So how, what the long-term impact of that is, I, as I say, I think the jury's out. Um, clearly, uh, research online and the ability to um, plagiarize uh, or in the future, as you rightly say, get AI to write an essay that's not plagiarized, but is not your work. Um, <laughs> yes, that's interesting. Although, as I say, it would also be a reason why I would advocate having um, the verbal context for grading, the research and writing context for grading, and also an exam for grading, because however good AI is to produce a paper, you aren't necessarily that good being questioned in, in class mm -hmm. and AI won't help you write an exam paper because mm -hmm. you won't have access to the internet during a prompted exam. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say you'll, you'll, get, you'll still be able to determine the genuine, I think, ability of a student through a combination of uh, ways of evaluating them. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. You, so going back to Carlos and the way he met you with this semester abroad. So you at Rockstone have taught these groups that come from the United States, but you also teach locals? Or no, well, um, very occasionally, but, but primarily what we do at the college are the two main 15-week uh, long semesters. So the spring semester and the fall semester. But we also do um, short-term programs through January and also May through August. So for example, if you go back to my, my starting at Roxton and was asked about you know, the four week summer program and then a two week program after that and then a 15 week semester. When I started at Roxton, we did um, four programs during the year. Mm -hmm. Those four, two 15 week semesters, a four week summer program and a two week, it was actually an executive MBA program. Um, this year we're doing 27 programs throughout the year. As I say, when I started, uh, it was 36 weeks and the college was closed and empty for the rest of the time. You can't afford to do that these days. So we have half a dozen programs for a week, two or three weeks in January, and then programs for, again, one, two or four weeks through May, through August, mid-May through August. And we could have, for example, three groups of 20 and at the same time doing entirely different programs. Mm -hmm. But for the semesters, they are students from institutions across the United States. That doesn't mean to say they're necessarily from the United States, but oh. they're students at institutions in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, we've had more than 250 American colleges and universities send students to Roxton. Now that might be one student or it could be dozens. So for example, the current semester where we have a group of 50 students in residence, we've got 17 from Fairleigh Dickinson University, um, our own parent institution. We've got 23 from um, American University in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. We've got eight, I believe, from Merrimack, which is in North Andover, Massachusetts and two from Duville University, which is in Buffalo, New York State. So it's a combination of individuals, not as I say, just from our own parent institution. Are any of them from other countries starting in the US? In the US? Um, this semester, no. Um, they are all from the United States, uh, from a variety across the United States, not just New Jersey or the Northeast, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm thinking of particularly we have a student from Texas, for example, but okay. we've had students from almost everywhere across the United States at one time or another. But it's not been unusual to have students from um, various Central and South American countries, for example. But we've, we've also had students, uh, though not at the moment, uh, from, from Russia and indeed Ukraine. Um, who've been studying in the United States and decided to spend a semester outside the United States mm -hmm. uh, in this country. Very interesting. Hmm. Okay, before going to the no part yes. of this interview, tell me of all these years after you started, you started saying yes to Roxton and what mm -hmm. Roxton had to offer you little by little. What has been the most memorable moment? And it doesn't have to be good, it has to be just memorable. Oh, there have been, I, I, I genuinely couldn't, couldn't name one. Um, uh, you would need a, a much longer interview for me to go <laughs> through uh, the various memorable things, good and bad, some of which I would not wish to be, be recorded. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, if I'm, it, it, it wouldn't be one specific event. I take, uh, the, the biggest thing I take from my experience is the array of more often than not wonderful people that I've been able to meet. Be they um, people who work at the college, uh, visiting speakers who I've able, been able to invite to come and speak at college and particularly um, my students. As I say, not necessarily all of them, 
but I've been very, very fortunate. The overwhelming majority have been wonderful, and I count, as I say myself, very, very fortunate indeed to have met them. Lovely. Okay, so now let's pivot to what was a moment in your life when you decided that saying no was a better idea? Um, well, I, I think I mentioned to you when we were talking previously um, that my family would probably, and some of my friends, uh, would probably say that my biggest problem is I never really know when to say no. <laughs> and I've, I've often taken on a lot um, at any one time. I would like to think I've been able to deliver but nevertheless, I perhaps should have said uh, no more often. Um, an example of that was actually, I went my first 10 years uh, working at the college, not taking a holiday. Oh. Um, and uh, uh, my, my mother and my, one of my brothers then booked the holiday and said, you're, you're coming. And I originally said no. And they said, well, you are because we've paid. So I then went. And uh, it was a vacation intervention. It was. And uh, I didn't realize how much I needed it until I experienced it. And subsequently, I've had a holiday every year since. I, uh, I like to climb mountains. So I've gone mountain climbing uh, okay. often uh, every year since then, or, or take, certainly take a holiday uh, every year <laughs> since then. So um, my original no, uh, which then was intervened to ensure that I went. Um, I think more, more particularly, um, there are, uh, well, I think I'm going to, again, break the rubric because I think there are three occasions when That's I've right. said, said no. Okay. Um, two, as, um, two as a child mm -hmm. uh, and uh, once, though, on several instances as, as an adult. Um, as a child, I was, so people told me, quite good at tennis mm -hmm. and it was suggested uh, when I was I know eight or nine that maybe I should take up tennis as a career mm -hmm. um, which would have meant I mean I enjoyed playing tennis mm -hmm. but I, I, I do remember thinking yes I, I enjoy playing it's quite fun every now and then mm -hmm. um, I didn't mind losing. I just enjoyed playing. So I, I certainly reached the conclusion that did I want to do this and do nothing else? Uh -huh. And I really didn't. So <laughs> I, I, I said no to that. Now, heavens above, could I have been, you know, oh, I'm showing my age, the next Jimmy Connors or, or <laughs> Boris Becker or some. I very much doubt it. Uh, and I certainly have absolutely no regrets of not <laughs> devoting my life to trying to play tennis. Uh, as I say, as an eight or nine year old, I thoroughly enjoyed playing. And I played through, through to my, well, I played at university, you know, occasionally, but um, it was a fun thing to do. It was not something I really ever wanted to take that seriously. So, you which don't is play it probably. Anymore? Oh, I have not been on a tennis court for a very, very long time. Okay. Um, I, I got actually more subsequently into, into badminton and, and table tennis, ping pong. But um, <laughs> of my, my game of choice would be badminton over tennis now. Maybe okay. that's an age thing. The other thing was I, I very much enjoyed uh, acting. And I was Ooh. in school plays and this sort of thing. And one of my um, acting... Uh, teachers um, had a, quite a, a few connections and tried to persuade me, you know, I, I was, you know, this is something that I could pursue as a career. Well, I think I might have been more inclined to be an actor than a tennis player. But equally, I, I this is when I was a teenager, so I suppose 14, 15. Um, <laughs> I was aware that it's a very precarious profession <laughs> um so precarious I, meaning you wouldn't have well, um be able to well eve even if you're very good you also have to be very lucky to okay. be in the right place at the right time and this sort of thing <laughs> and um 
and I think by then also I was, I, well, I know I was more interested in politics. So um, I think, you know, I, I, I was the, of the opinion that, well, if you do acting, you can always join an amateur, you know, club. And anyway, teaching is a bit like acting as well. You're on show and you can, you, you know, you have an audience, whether they like it or not. Um, so maybe I combined acting with my teaching. But um, th those are those are two instances when I've when I have ha said no, but um, more seriously, I suppose, on several occasions, um, it, it has been suggested that I apply for jobs in the United States, for example, either teaching positions or indeed administrative positions. Mm -hmm. And I have never really had to think hard about that because I don't see myself living outside this country. I'm, I'm not only very English and family ties and so on, mm -hmm. but um, uh, teaching British government and politics, you really do need to be here mm -hmm. um, and a, 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 a alert to all the nuances and so on that you wouldn't, you really wouldn't pick up on outside the country. Um, so, as I say, I've had the opportunity on several occasions. I've never really seriously considered it. Uh, it's not been a difficult decision to say no to mm -hmm. those things. It's so interesting how, when it came to the yeses, or one of these yeses um, that led you to this life, they were very easy to make. Yes, but, because as I say, they didn't necessarily seem like a big decision at the time. No, but the same way, when you talk about these no's, they seem also to be very easy because for some reason you had certain things very clear, like, hmm, no, I don't think this is gonna be my path, or no, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this for a long time, or, it's it's interesting. It's kind of the same feeling, but on, on both sides. Maybe you have said more yeses than noes, but these noes have also had this, hmm, I think this is not for me. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, I... I you had it I, clear, very, yes. very deep inside. You didn't yeah, have I, to struggle. No, I, I don't think any of those were, 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 were agonizing decisions to make. Um, when you mention the acting, you're quite a funny guy now. I know. Really? Okay. <laughs> I've gathered. <laughs> <laughs> so the acting that interested you was comedy, or were you, uh, when oh. when it was suggested that you go that route, were they thinking of you as a more serious actor? Oh, I don't. I'm not sure that serious acting was the uh, the idea. Um, me as you know. Laurence Olivier or something like that. I think it would have always tended to have been comedy, yes. And I, you know, I've, I've done some, uh, I've not really stand up, I've recorded some um, stand up performances and things like that. So um, yeah, um, I'd like to, I like to perform, but as I say, I include it in my teaching really. Although, you know, um, political speeches, uh, always try and, get a joke or, or, or whatever in there, although you have to be quite careful because you don't want to be seen as not serious. But, you know, I, I, um, when I was, gosh, eight, nine, ten years old, I took um, elocution lessons, speech lessons, uh, learning how to read poetry in public. I used to love, um, actually, at that sort of time as well, reading in church. I don't mean just sitting there reading a book. I mean reading from the pulpit, lessons in, in church, uh, parts, you know, uh, sections from the Bible and so on. I like the sound. Well, people would say I like the sound of my own voice, but mm -hmm. I like I liked how the voice sounded in church. You know, in mm -hmm. the acoustics of church and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, I I like the the art of communication, verbal communication, and the subtleties in verbal communication, mm -hmm. uh, which teaching provides. As I say, whether I'm any good at it is another matter. But I I enjoy what I do for that, those reasons. About the stand-up stand comedy that you've recorded, is that something we can find on YouTube? <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I want to do, uh, I want to do that, but... Um, uh, Does Carlos know that you've done that? 
Uh, I don't know. You'll have to ask him that. I don't know if that ever came to light when uh, when he was here at the college. Hmm. Ah, you did that very long time ago. Oh, it's a while ago. Yes, I haven't. I haven't done that recently. Yes. Ah. Oh, but I, I, I used to. Uh, oh gosh, for my my sister and my brothers record. You know, um, this is when we had cassette tapes, so it shows how long <laughs> ago it was. Stories using funny voices and all sorts of things like that to entertain them at times. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to picture the the three notes integrated into your teaching. So the tennis somehow well, is I use my hands a lot. <laughs> that is the hand, but it's also the back and forth between you and the students. I move around a lot. I move around the uh, lecture hall like it's a tennis court. <laughs> no, but not also physically, also intellectually, the back and forth of ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the tennis. Okay. We have the acting down. Yeah. And the subject matter is the politics. There you are. It's all there. <laughs> so even though you said no to these, they came back to this beautiful yes that has led <laughs> you to this 30-something life at Ruxton College. Wonderful. Yeah. See? It all came for <laughs> full circle. <laughs> there you are. Sounds good. <laughs> so before finishing, I have been adding a new question at the end. Oh, can I interrupt? Yes. Because if you if you want to see um, acting or me playing the fool, for example, <laughs> we um, during lockdown we mm. put together a Mad Hatter's Tea Party video, and I dressed up as uh, the Mad Hatter. What's and, a Mad Hatter? Oh, Alice in Wonderland. The story I of am, Alice in Wonderland. And the, I no? I know very little. <laughs> okay, well. Um, Look it up, but that okay. is available online. You can okay. find that. So if you want an image and seeing how stupid I can be, look that up. I look it up. And can I can I add a screenshot of that at the end By of all the means. video? By all means. Yes. I have your permission. You do. <laughs> okay. So the last question that also has to do with what you mentioned, that you're at the end of your career here. Not sure how many years you're gonna stay. Uh, well, I'm not sure either, but. Uh... <laughs> so what is the next, what if I say yes, that you're considering? Um, I don't know. As I say, I don't really plan ahead. I'm just you well, know, grateful to wake up each morning and I find myself not in the obituaries. So um, <laughs> uh, we will see. I mean, tomorrow is another day and um, we'll, we'll carry on until I can't carry on, I suppose. Okay, so then when you do retire, from I'm not sure that, I, that that's not on my agenda. I, I'm just going to carry on. I, uh, and, uh, unless you know something I don't, and there's a letter. Well, because you phone. mentioned you're at, you were at the end of. Well, yes, I'm 64 years old. Ah, Maybe. you said that because of your age. Yes, I mean, you know, I'm not. I'm not starting out at the age of 20. What was it? 20. <laughs> 20. 27 when I took over as head of the college and I'm now nearly 65 so I'm I'm you know I'm not thinking about what I'll be doing in you know 30 years time no because then <laughs> I understood that as you were already thinking about retirement no, I'm I'm certainly not okay but I'm, I'm not at the start of a career <laughs> I mean 60 something is very young thank you I love you <laughs> okay, well, Nicolas, a reminder then, you have to send me, if you I've, I've, I've made a note, send you pictures of, of, of me and, and actually the college and, and so on, so I'll do that certainly. And you can look up the Mad Hatter's Tea Party on the uh, Roxton Fairly Dickinson website, you can find the whole recording still. Okay, I'll, I'll look it up for sure. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Well, thank, thank you for that. Hopefully it's what you were looking for or? Yes, it's even more than what I was envisioning. Thank you so much. You're it's very been generous. A pleasure. Now I understand. I mean, now I put together all these stories and all the love and admiration that Carlos has for you with meeting you, even if it's through Zoom. So now it all makes sense. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Lovely thank conversation. You. And I will email you the information and pictures. Yes. And okay. uh, take care.
Thank you. You too. Bye bye. bye.